So welcome to this tutorial which is going to reproduce an effect which was made famous a few versions of Houdini ago, uh, which is where a bullet comes and smashes through a glass which contains liquid. And it, it uses several types of simulation in Houdini, so it's quite a good way to look at rigid bodies and also at liquid simulations. And over here I've just got the standard things that you need to render, some lights and a backdrop. I'm going to render this in Octane rather than in Mantra. And I've got a glass which I've modeled separately and I'm importing it and transforming it to lie on the plane. And that is the, all there is to that. And then I'm creating the initial liquid here. And I'm doing that by importing that glass, blasting away the outside part of it clipping that so it's a bit shorter, poly extruding, extruding the top there, grouping those edges, poly filling that so that it's like enclosed, and then using the points from volume to fill it with points. Now at the moment we have 13,000 points here, which is very, very low for a, for a fluid simulation, so you'd want to reduce your point separation a lot uh, for a real simulation, but by having so few points, we can at least uh, play this back in, in real time. So the first thing I'm going to do is, in fact, the rigid body simulation. I'm actually going to just turn off this water or liquid because it's not relevant for this. And the first thing we want to do is shatter this glass. And I'm going to do that using an RBD material fracture node which is new in Houdini 17, I think. And this takes geometry, and it takes various other inputs, one of which is the points which are going to be fractured. I'll demonstrate this in a moment. So the first thing I'm going to do is set this to glass. And then if I click on this, it'll take a while to, to calculate, and it'll show here that we have an impact here. You can see that this is where the the glass is going to shatter from. But it's treating the whole glass as a single object. Whereas obviously if we had a bullet uh, going through this glass it would have a shatter here and a shatter here. So that's what we need to set up. So what I've done here is created a line which we can see here if we click this. Uh, which goes through the glass, and it has four points, uh, one at either end and two inside, and I'm going to project these onto the glass to create the to create the impact points that we're going to need. So I'm going to use a ray sop, like so, and the first input takes the points, and the second input think takes the thing we're going to project onto, which is our glass work. Let's try again. Yeah, there we go. So what we should see now, well, we need to change the settings on this. Uh, we need to project rays, and we're not going to use the normal. We're going to use the minimum distance function, which is going to more or less get it right. That is a little bit off. So let me select that middle line hit T to transform it, make sure that we can see the other thing, whoops, like so, and then align this to the world, and we can just move this up a bit, and then along a bit there, I think that's more or less it so that they're straight. So what the race hop is doing is it's finding the nearest point to each of those points. So we start off here, if we look here, uh, and we turn on the visibility of points. Uh, you can probably just about see we've got point there, point there, point there, and point there. And it's projecting those points, moving them onto the nearest point of the glass. And thus we're getting those four points here. And these are the things that we're going to feed into the last not sure why we've got that. Not sure why we've got that uh, box there. That seems to be a fault with the display. 
there we go, disappeared. Right, let's go back to this. So now what we should see, whoops, we need to put those points into the last. Now what we should see is, ah, we need to change something on here, uh, which is that we need to set it to have input points. And now we can see, turn the display of points off, that we've got an impact here and an impact on the other side too. So that uh, that more like the bullet passing through. So the next step is to create the rigid body simulation that's going to simulate this glass smashing. So we can do that by taking the mixture of the glass selected. Let me minimize this. And then with the glass selected, you go up to the rigid body tool shelf here. But you don't use the RBD glued objects tool, which you might think you might use. This node, the RBD material fracture node, is set up to work with the RBD objects tool. So let's just cl click that. And that should have generated an auto dot network, yes. And it will also have added some things into this glass network here. So let me have a look at this first. So this is what we had before, everything above here. And let's lay that out using the L key. There are three chains coming off here. This one, we don't need to worry about. We're not going to use it. This one is a constraints network that's being generated automatically by this node here. And that's, uh, that's something we're going to talk about a lot uh, in a moment. And then finally here is the chain which is taking the geometry, adding a rest attribute to it, converting it into packed primitives. And this is where a single point, if you like, represents the whole of one fragment. Um, you can number of tutorials on, on packed primitives. Uh, but that's basically what's happening. And that is a more efficient way of simulating the geometry. And then this is the DOP import that's bringing back the results of the simulation into this network. But the important thing to remember is that almost always the tools create the simulation so that it's bringing the geometry in from the input to this node. So this is the geometry that's going into the simulation and here it is coming out of the simulation again. And let's look now at that dot network which is where the simulation is going to happen. Hit L to lay that out. So we've got our glass coming in as an RBD packed object, and then we're applying some constraints. And there are two types of constraints that are set up by the tool. There's a glue constraint, and there's a soft constraint. Now, in fact, we're not going to use the soft constraint. We're just going to use the glue constraint, and in a moment, uh, yet another kind of constraint. And this is what uh, is being used to set up the constraints. It's taking a SOP path, which is pointing back to that null uh, where the constraints were. Those constraints are being generated by that RBD fracture node in the in the network earlier. And this is just setting up the constraints and rigid body solver and gravity and so on. Uh, so to make this work, I'm going to need to add a few more things, uh, one of which is to add a ground plane. So I've done that, but let me switch it off because it's conflicting with our backdrop. So the ground plane is going to make sure things crash into the ground properly. And the other thing I need to do is have a look at our bullet, and we're going to need to simulate the bullet. So I've got a bullet here, uh, and I'm just again bringing this in from a file and transforming it. But we need a path uh, for it to, to go along. So Let's um, create one. And I'm going to do that um, by using an object merge. Uh, let's call this bullet path. And I'm going to object merge in uh, the line that we drew earlier in order to create those points that were used for the impact points for the glass. And there we are. We've got that in a bullet path, like so. Uh, of course, it's not going to be long enough. So let's transform it 
and in the x direction let's scale it say by 10. I think that should be enough. So the next step is to get the bullet to move along this path. Let's set it so we're looking through the camera. And we can do that using the shelf tools. Make sure we've got nothing selected. Go up here to the constraint shelf and we're going to use the follow path tool. So the first thing it wants us to do is select the object that's going to move along the path. Press enter. Then the path. Press enter. And I don't want to look at object or look up object. And we can see that now this has appeared at the end of our path and is animated to go along the path. I should say a word about how I've got the scene set up here. It's got an unusually low number of frames, 74. That's because uh, when we come to simulate, it's actually a very heavy simulation. So, it, or it can be if you use a lot of points. So I've limited it to just three seconds so you get an idea of what's happening. And if we have a look at the animation options, we can see very importantly here, the frames per second is huge. And this is set to a number which is roughly accurate for a bullet which travels at about 800 meters per second and so this frames per second it works out that this is traveling roughly at the speed of a real bullet and it gives us that slow motion effect that we want when the glass is smashed and you can set this up just by editing these options here in the Global Animations Options dialog. So the next thing we need to do is make this bullet into an object which can interact with the glass. And we're going to use here on the collision tabs a static object. So with our bullet selected, let's hit the static object tool. And if we now look in our auto dot network and hit L to lay out, what we should see, this is our original glass, this now is a static solver with the ground plane and the bullet, and the two should interact. Let's have a look at our bullet. So the first thing is that we're going to need to use user object transform, that's fine. And let's have a look at the collisions for the bullet. And at the moment, uh, the bullet is set up to use volume collisions, and that isn't really what we want. So I was getting ahead of myself there. In fact, uh, we'll need to look at the RBD solver collisions later when we come to the fluid simulation. But for the moment, this rigid body simulation is going to use bullet, and therefore this is the relevant tab. And we can have a look and see what the bullet solver looks like by zooming in on our bullet and we can turn off this display geometry toggle here and instead have a look at the guide geometry and we can see by default it's setting up a convex hull that's pretty good but to make it even more efficient I'm going to use a capsule like this and let's uh, zoom out and see what that simulation now looks like it's looking pretty good actually that looks pretty good. So, for my mind, the bullet is traveling a little bit too slowly. It's not hitting the glass at the right moment. So let's go back into our bullet node. And if we double click on this, this stuff down here has been created when we use the shelf tool create a static object. But this constraints network here is what was set up when we constrained it along the path and if we double click on this we can see that we've got a node here called path and the position here is what's going to tell Houdini at what point along the line to put the bullet at each frame and at the moment that's just taking the current frame dividing it by the total number of frames so at the beginning here it's going to be at one end of the line at the end it's going to be at the other end of the line I'm going to make it go a little bit faster and I'm going to do that by using dollar $t times 200. So now this is in effect traveling at 200 meters per second. It's a bit slower than a real bullet, but still pretty fast. So if we now scrub through this, uh, we can see unfortunately it's rotating round. So the bullet 
coming back to the start and, and rotating like that. And we don't want that. So we need to clamp it. So we use a clamp function. And we type. And what this should mean is that it quite quickly goes along, hits the glass at sort of frame 10 or so, and then just stays at the end for the rest of the simulation. So I think we're now ready to save out that data, save out the simulation. And we can do that by going to the glass here. And we can see that we've got a DOP import here, which is importing those glass fragments, which we can see there. And we're going to save this out. So I'm going to use a file cache like so. And actually, I'm going to change this here because I tend to save my caches in a directory called cache so they don't get mixed up with any geometry that we're importing. And I'm going to call it uh, rbd glass, say, dot dollar f dot bgo dot sc. And we want to save the whole frame range. So let me just do that. Save to disk. That has saved to disk. And now we can load from disk. Like so. So I see that the earlier on when I showed you the frames per second settings that didn't show up in the video. Uh, so I'll go through that again. So we've got frames per second at 4,000, and we've got 74 frames. So 4,000 is a huge number of frames per second, but that is what causes that sort of slow motion effect of the glass splitting apart. When we play it back later on, we're going to use 24 frames per second, so it's going to have the slow motion effect. Uh, and you can just set this up by typing in 4,000 here and changing the end here and then pressing close that's all I did at the beginning so that's the that's the frame rate here explained and that of course affects the simulation so the gravity and so on is all rel relative to that uh, frame rate so now we've finished the rigid body part of that simulation we're going to need to concentrate on the fluid part and we're simulating the two separately which is not strictly accurate because what should happen is the water should affect the glass and the glass the water because the glass is heavier than the water in general you can get away with the glass affecting the water but not the other way around that's what we're doing here we're simulating the glass first and then those pieces of glass can affect the water but not vice versa so the first thing i'm going to do is rename our existing dot network to rbd dot network and then I'm going to create a new one. You won't be able to see this on the video. If you right click on this button down here, you get an option to create a new simulation, which it's put over here. Let's move it. And I'm going to call this uh, fluid dop network. So the next step is to create our fluid. And as you remember, we prepared a fluid in this node here, uh, which is created using this points from volume and we can with this node visualize it with this node selected we go here to the particle fluids tab and select flip fluid from object and that's going to set up a basic simulation here in this fluid dot network so we've got the flip fluid object and we've got our solver basically and gravity so the flip fluid object is going to take that water start node and import something from it. Now, by default, it's not importing the right thing. It's thinking this is a surface sop. Actually, what we should set this to is particle, f particle field, and then we can see our points. And the other thing we need to do is change the boundaries of this... Where are we? The boundaries of the box which is on the flip solver so the box starts off far too big so we can see here it's box size is 50 by 50 by 50 
we can start off with something like two by two by two probably and then we can raise this bottom bit up like so because we're not gonna particles below the floor are going to disappear and then maybe raise this up a little bit here so that's sorted out uh, the basis of our fluid simulation the other thing we're going to need is another floor so on the collisions tab here click ground plane I'm going to immediately turn off the visibility of that because we have a backdrop and let's go into our fluid network and let's see what happens if we press play and we can see our fluid immediately disintegrates and the reason for that is that we've got our particle separation set to point 0.1 here but the original particle separation uh, we set up on the water start node is of course 0 0.005 so I need to make sure these two are the same so I'm going to copy this parameter go back into the fluid network and paste a relative reference and that'll make sure I'm clicking middle click that we can make sure that that is the same so let's hit play and see what happens and we can see almost nothing happens and that's because uh, we're running at 4000 frames per second gravity's effect per frame is going to be very very small if I ran this for 2000 frames you'd see the the liquid start to fall down we hit L to, to lay this out so the next thing we need to do is make sure that the liquid can interact with the bullet and with the glass so let's start with the glass and what I'm going to do is create a separate geometry object and I'm going to say call this glass collider maybe and I'm going to import the results of this file cache here so let's stick a null on the end of this so let's call this rbd out and then in this new node here let's set, lay down object merge and make sure that we are collecting the rbd out and that's going to give us uh, these pieces of glass that are going to explode like so when the bullet hits them and this is going to be what we're going to use to collide so with this selected on my shelf tool here on the collision shelf tool I'm going to hit static object and that is going to do some things in here it's going to create a collision source node that's the thing that makes the the volumes that the liquid is going to collide with it's got a file cache it's got a VDB and so on and it should also have imported these into our fluid dot network let's lay this out again we can now see we've got this thing called glass collider and let's turn off the visibility of the flip fluid for a second and let's zoom in on this hit collisions and this is going to be there are two types of collision data uh, there's the RBD solver data which is going to be used if we use the if we're using this to collide with a liquid and this bullet which we were using earlier so the one we want is this one here and I'm going to turn off display of geometry and actually that looks uh, pretty good good but this is going to change at each frame so it's going to be recalculated at every frame but we're not seeing any change and the reason for that is that on this object we need to say use deforming geometry and that means it's going to collect the geometry at every frame so what it should mean if we go up to say frame 17 right we can see that this geometry is now as we would expect uh, exploding all over the place so we want to save time on the simulation so what I'm going to do is cash out I go to this glass collider node which is this thing that has the the VDBs in it we were just looking at. VDB is a type of volume uh, and it's the way that Houdini calculates collisions between a liquid and an object like a glass is to convert the glass into a volume and then use that to, to create to, to, to calculate the collisions. 
Now, fortunately, there's a file cache node here. I'm going to change this a little bit. Let's uh, call this uh, cache uh, glass VDB, perhaps, like so. And let's save this to disk so that we've got all of it cached out. It's not going to take very long. Uh, not quite sure why it's saying that it's going up to 147, uh, because it's calculating every second frame. It's calculating fractional frames. That's done. So I can now load that from disk. That'll make things a bit click quicker. So let me go into our fluid simulation again. And let's have a look and see what it looks like. So let me go back to displaying the geometry, get rid of the guide and let's play it through. We need to make sure we can see the flip object as well. Let's zoom out a bit and let's play it through. Ah, well of course uh, there's an object that we've got missing here that's rather important which is the bullet. So let's go back and put that into our simulation. So with the bullet selected choose static object and that should have created down here a volume representation and also in our network we should have the bullet so let's move this so where we can see it let's have a look at our bullet collisions it's using a volume sample And let's change that to an implicit sphere, perhaps, and get rid of that. That doesn't seem to be working. Let's keep it back in volume sample. Uh, and now we should see a different uh, simulation. As the liquid is torn apart by the moving pieces. So the final part of the simulation, at least, is to convert these particles into a surface. And that happens here inside the water start fluid node. It's just called water start fluid because that's what we call our original node. So let me put that down below here. Not actually going to use the interior for this because we're going to try rendering in octane. So, what's going on inside here? Well, we're getting those particles, but also various fields that are used to calculate the fluid simulation. We're compressing them, uh, and then you can here, if you want, write those files out to disk to speed up simulation later on. Uh, it's then fed into a particle fluid surface node, which is what's going to create our polygonal geometry, or in this case, polygonal soup. And then you can cache that out. And then finally, there's the render flag there. Now, we are going to render this in Octane. And there can be difficulties in Octane and other renderers in handling extremely detailed geometry. So one of the issues when you render a scene that is this complicated is that the size of this geometry being created can get quite large. In this case, it's only five megabytes. But if you get up to, say, 500,000 particles instead of 13,000 or whatever we've got here, the size of this object can get really big. It can get to, say, uh, 20 or 30 megabytes. And that can cause crashes when you use Octane. And the reason it's so big uh, is partly because it's surfacing all of these 
little tiny particles here. And there's a way that we can take these out of this surfacing and treat them separately, which is more efficient. So let's show you how to do that. So let's go back into the fluid simulation, which is down here, fluid.network. And let's have a look at the flip solver. And the flip solver has various parameters here that you can change in order to affect your simulation. I'm, I'm going to do a few here. First of all is I'm going to stop it from reseeding particles, uh, because in this kind of incredibly splashy simulation is probably not going to make much difference and it takes up time. Uh, you don't need to include separation. Separation is where the solver calculates if a fluid is being compressed, it pushes the particles out again. Again, in this kind of simulation here, it's not going to make much difference. The one that's of interest to us here is droplets. And if we turn on direct droplets, uh, what this will do is it will work out where the particles have become separated from the main simulation and it will give them an attribute called droplet and if that droplet is near one that means that they can be treated as individual particles they're not really connected to the rest of the fluid and this kind of very very dynamic simulation there are going to be a lot of droplets so I've switched that on and that means that here in the Uh, in the water start fluid where it's being surfaced uh, we can try and treat those droplets separately however uh, this fluid compress node is going to cause problems if we use it so in fact I'm going to disable it fluid compress is extremely useful if you've got something like an ocean or a big tank of fluid where there's a bit of action on the surface of the fluid and then there's a lot of, if you like, wasted space with particles underneath the surface which are not really uh, moving that much uh, but would be costly to store. That doesn't really apply in this case because all of, you know, this is, this is being torn apart. There's no sort of interior space here really. So we're not losing too much by deleting the fluid compress node and because we delete it, we can be sure that we're going to get this droplet attribute as we would want. So let me take uh, these and these and move them out of the way. And then I'm going to lay down a split node. And a split node uh, splits what is coming in according to the value of the group or of an attribute. So in this case, I'm going to say at droplet is greater than 0 0.5. This is the need to make sure there are no spaces here. What that is going to do is it's going to split those particles into particles that have a droplet score and the ones that don't. And in fact, I think we need to invert the selection, if I remember right, because let me just see what's here. So there's nothing. That's right. So this second output is going to give you the things which where droplet is greater than 0.5. The first output is going to give you everything else. At the moment, because we're at the beginning of the simulation, there are no droplets, so this is going to be empty. So let me just rename this droplets. And let's play through the simulation. Say to about there. And let's see whether we've got any droplets here. Still don't have any droplets. Well, there's a reason that we're not seeing anything here, and that's because I've made a mistake on the split node. If we have a look at our geom geometry spreadlet, spreadsheet, uh, we can see that the droplet values are getting quite small, so there should be a couple of droplets here. Ah! 
I've uh, got to set this to points. That will help. So now we have 850 droplets. That is the reason that wasn't working. And here we won't have any droplets at all. So this means that those outlying... Uh, let's have a look at these on the, on the view here. Uh, so if we select that, you can see all of these sort of outlying drops of water. We're not going to try and surface these. Um, we're going to treat them as particles and render them as particles in Octane uh, when we come to do that. So I've just now rendered out to disk those surfaces and I've done the full frame range so that now uh, we can just load them in like so. And we're still using this very, very small number of particles, so it's going to be a pretty crude simulation at the moment. So the next thing we need to do is to set up something which will allow us to use those particles. So let me lay down another geo node, and let me name this droplet. And we're going to just object merge in the droplets. Like so. So as I mentioned, I've got this set up to render in Octane. So I've got here in the shop network some materials, a backdrop material, a glass material, a water material, and the material for our bullet. And I've got a render target which is set up to render 2,000 samples using a path tracing kernel. We've got a little tiny bit of daylight, uh, but we've also got set up here three lights, in other words, three grids which are emitting light here, octane light one, two, and three. And on each of these, on the Octane tab, the Light sub-tab, we've set this up to emit. So the other thing we need to do is just make sure that uh, each of the items has the right material. Yes, that's set up to use Octane Glass. You select that properly. That seems to be using an old version. Uh, then the fluid should be using. I'm going to change that to use the water, and the droplets are also going to use the water. And for the droplets, we need to go onto the Octane tab, and we need to render as sphere particles, and the radius is going to be the radius that we set up all the way back here, which is this one, particle separation, radius, same thing. So I'm going to copy this parameter, go back into here, and paste a relative reference. So that's going to make sure that renders as particles. We don't need to render the glass collider object. We do need the water. We do need the we don't need the bullet path, so we can turn that off. We do need the bullet, and we do need the glass. Okay, and that's rendering RBD out, so that should be good. So let's see what that looks like when we render. So I'm going to hit the Octane IPR button. Um, we can see our bullet is coming out all right. Our liquid is probably all right. But something weird is happening here. Two weird things, in fact. Um, this has various artifacts on it, the glass, that we probably don't want to see, and secondly, it's this weird color. Uh, so we need to correct those errors. So the first thing uh, that I'm going to do is create yet another node, which is I'm going to call glass for render. Now the reason that we're getting those funny artifacts on the glass are because when you render the fractured version, even though it's all joined up, you're getting some odd shapes. So what we want to do is go back to the original glass and collect the initial glass. And then I'm going to Control-C, Control-V this. And then 
and this is going to be the fractured glass after the simulation and then we need a switch node and we need to switch at the time that the let me just uh, zoom in on this right we need to switch at the time that the bullet hits the glass so let's just step through this three four five six seven eight nine so frame ten so what we want is when dollar ff is greater than or equal to ten it's going to swap to the second one that's the fractured version so for the first nine frames it's going to use the unfractured version this one which is going to render perfectly and then for the rest it's going to use this one so that's cool uh, let's have another look at the IPR let's move back to here right well that's uh, ah we're still rendering the original one so we need to turn the render flag off that one and just keep it on the glass for render try the IPR again right and we can now see that the outside of that is still smooth but it still has this weird color so the weird color is what happens when Octane detects a material that it can't find um, so why is that happening given well actually we haven't set a material on this but uh, let me just do so and we, the problem will still be there and the reason for it is uh, that actually there's something going on in this RBD out object um, that's middle click on this and you can probably just see that it's got packed fragments and usually the reason that that shader here is not working is because there's a shader defined on geometry here and that would normally be a primitive attribute called shop material path. Uh, if we can look here, there, there doesn't appear to be a primitive attribute like that. But then we have to remember that these are packed fragments. So we've got to look inside the fragments too. So let's unpack those fragments. And let's have a look now. Now we have a bit more like it, lots of polygons. And now we can see, well you probably can't see on this on this video, but there is actually a shot material path attribute as a prim attribute here. So we need an attribute delete, like so. And that shot material path is being introduced uh, by default as part of the RBD setup. And we need to delete that, so we delete the shot material path, and that should mean now uh, that we're going to get the right thing and let's just check this one here and we can see that even in the unfractured version there's a shot material path and I suspect this has been introduced as part of the import process that the model for the glass was done in a different program and Houdini when importing it has created this shot material path so in fact we need this attribute delete to come down the bottom here so that it applies to the glass at whatever stage it is in the simulation and let's go back up and let's try an IPR again and now we can see we're getting a proper glass let me just pause this go to some later frame where we have a nice explosion like so and reload that and we're seeing a nice render there so I want to do one more thing to improve the efficiency of the render and that is to cache out these droplets because otherwise they're being simulated at every frame so let's lay down a file cache node and let's point this at cache droplets dot dollar f dot bgo dot sc 
And let's save those to disk, which will take a moment. In fact, let me pause the video while that's happening. Okay, that's finished rendering, so I can make sure it's loaded from disk, like so. And that should mean that now we can scrub through this without any simulation happening. We're not seeing the fluid at the moment, and that's because in this water start fluid network, the display flag is here on the droplets, and we actually want it here on the render node. And now we should see, yeah, we see everything. So that's a look at how you can set up and render this simulation of a bullet hitting a glass full of fluid in Houdini 17 and rendering it with Octane. I hope it's been useful.